Welcome everyone to Successful Iranians podcast and we have got a special guest today. I've been on her ankles virtually from the Atlantic, the other side of the pond, and it's the wonderful and the ever vescent lady called Bita Melanian. How are you? I'm wonderful, Johnny. How are you? Yeah, good. Good, thanks. So people might think, how do we know each other? We know each other through the days of social audio, Clubhouse. Yes, the pandemic app that people refer to. And Bita is someone that I hugely admire and respect. She's an incredible lady doing incredible things. She's not only a marketing executive who's passionate about giving back to her community, the Iranian community, where she does a lot of stuff. Served as the SVP of global marketing for Ribbon, public traded company, communications. Also does a lot of stuff around foundations where she's the executive director of Farhang Foundation. The community organizer got a, her beautiful food <laughs> business called Beta Kitchen, where I salivate with all the food that she does with her reels, from the gourmet sabzi to the tadik to the mustard yard, to the badam gin, to you name it. And you might tell that I'm rather hungry because it's approaching nearly seven o'clock here in the UK. And apart from all of that, just an incredible human being that was also at one point recognized as being part of the 10 most successful business women to watch in 2020 and a member of Forbes Business Council. Have I done any justice with that synopsis or do you want to add some more? You are highly, Johnny. You are outdoing yourself with this introduction and I'm so honored and so grateful to be here with you today. And also, yes, the pandemic was tough, but it also had many beautiful facets, including getting close to old friends and meeting new ones like I have met you. So well, thank you again for having me on. The pleasure is all mine. The pleasure is all mine. So first and foremost, who really is Beta? The face behind the Instagram reels, the stories, the things that you see on LinkedIn, the stuff that you've been known for on TV shows and radio stations. Who really are you? I think everybody is multifaceted and I'm definitely one of those human beings. And I enjoy having, experiencing life and having all those different sides to myself, but at the end of the day, I'm a daughter, a sister, a wife, a grandmother. I am a friend. I have wonderful friends that support me and I hope to be supportive of them. I'm a woman in tech. I'm a woman in business and I'm an advocate of many causes I'm passionate about. I closely identify myself as a refugee and an immigrant from Iran whose culture is in my DNA, a country that is so beautiful and I hope to see are people free one day very soon yeah absolutely i think we all want that first and foremost woman life freedom has taken us and the community every part of us from september to the current date let's unpack a bit your story your life in iran and your journey in coming to the united states let's talk about the younger version of vita that little girl who then transformed into the person that you are now. I think that little girl still lives in me. I'm turning 50 this September, but I still remember the 13 year old Bita leaving Iran, Tehran, where I lived with my parents in 1986 to become an overnight refugee with my mother. And then later with my brother joining us in Germany. I was in little rewind is I, I was six years old when the revolution happened. And I remember those days, oddly enough, very vividly, maybe it's because we were all together as a family and there was so much turmoil happening. And then right after that, a year or so after the revolution, the Iran Iraq war started, there were some, some really dark days that luckily as human beings, as we get older and we get busy with life we tend to forget and or not think about so much. So that's the foundation of who I am as far as growing up as a young child, as an Iranian child born there. 
And yes, I, as a 13 year old, my mother, one day who did not want to leave Iran ever, my father was always an advocate wanting to immigrate and moving to the US because my un uncle, my brother's, my dad's brother lived here for years already with his family, always wanted to leave the country early on before the revolution even. And my mom was the one who wanted to stay back and fast forward to 1986 when the Islamic regime of Iran really was honing in and op the oppression level alongside of the challenges that we're facing with the war were at its peak and young people were being picked up on the streets for no reason at all. And I was one of those kids who was targeted one day on the street, just walking with my friend. And my mother decided overnight that it's time to leave. And that's when we left first, my mom and I. And then my, one of my older brothers joined us about a couple of months later and became refugees in Germany. And that's when the whole immigrant journey started with my father staying back together with my grandmother and my other brother. And we finally figured it all out. And fast forward through all the challenges, we ended up in the US in 1989. And that's where my father and my mother had to start life over again at the ages of 45 and 50. Um, just like many other Iranian immigrant families. And at the time in the early 90s, the community wasn't as tight and as close and as expanded as it is today. So everybody had to figure it out on their own. And so I'm very proud of my parents to really build their lives from scratch again. And my generation, where I have many friends from those decades to this day, I'm so proud to see each of us really going out there and figuring it out all on our own, starting to work at a very young age, as soon as it was legal to make our own pocket money and figuring out financial aid to go to college and starting our careers. So that's where my immigrant life journey started. And here we are, um, 2023, um, living in Los Angeles still, where I immigrated originally with my parents. Fascinating, because... The biggest brain drain of any country ever seen is that of Iran, where 8 million reportedly have left the country from the cult of death and the cult of misery that Islamic Republic has created. And I'll tell you, I've just thought of one thing for you as another business venture, and maybe that of anti-aging, because you certainly don't look 50. Let's put it that way. Thank for you. those of you who will attach the video, you does not look like 50 at all. I'll Thank you. I don't know. I, I think leading a health, trying to lead a healthier life, which I wasn't doing before and taking care of self-care is something that we, most of us ignore. Uh, I've been trying to be good about it since 2020, actually at the beginning of pandemic or a couple of years prior, I started and I really started focusing more on it during the pandemic. So I hope to keep up with it, but thank you. <laughs> it's definitely working. Afarin, so for my little bit of fun. <laughs> um, so let's, now get into the revolution, the Masa yes. Amini revolution of women life freedom. And you've been an activist, a strong activist for this revolution. I've seen a lot of your stories, your reels, the, the, the travels that you've done. I think you went somewhere in Scandinavia where you attended conferences and everything else. What impact has it had on your life? And have you always been an activist? I think as immigrants and refugees and people who come from these types of environments at our core, each of us are a form of activist. The murder of Mahsojina Amini in September of 2022, which ignited the woman life freedom, has brought out that activist in each of us. Not everybody has a huge platform on social media but I believe that every single person's voice matters and will have impact because we all have friends, colleagues, neighbors. Throughout this past few months, everybody has become essentially a voice and needs to believe that their voice does matter. I've always tried to, in my own way, in the early 2000s, when I realized I reconnected with my roots and my culture and my identity as an Iranian, because when you leave, at age of 13 and you get so busy, each of us became so focused on finding ourselves and building our lives from scratch. Most of us forgot about where we came from or didn't have time to think about our heritage and history, that the rich history that we all come from. And I had to relearn and really 
reach out to different sources. And I was lucky enough that I crossed paths with people who taught me about my history and my heritage. So in the early 2000s, I became involved with the, many of our nonprofits that were starting at the time, charities that were starting to help children in Iran and really start to give back. And that's my, where my journey as an activist or a community organizer and builder started, applying what I learned in my professional life in these types of environments. And now fast forward, I think each of us can really be impactful using our experience and our professional background and our network, which is very important to be the voice of Iranian people and to continue amplifying their message in pursuit of true freedom and regime change in Iran. Yeah, it's that Rumi quote I've mentioned several times, alone you're a drop in the ocean, together we become the ocean. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people think, oh, me, what, what difference do I make? But when we add the sum of all the parts, it leads to something great. And your platform as well, you've got a big influential platform in terms of your community, because not just the numbers, it's also the engagement of the platform. Absolutely. The connectivity. Absolutely. That's actually more critical, to be honest. So we've, it's coming up to nearly one year. Can you believe it? Yeah. With, with the revolution in September. I just can't quite believe how time has gone by. And at the end of last year, we had that tweet from all the main players in terms of the diaspora and the coalition of unity for the revolution. Yes. And then we had the meeting in Washington, I think it was. Yeah, I was there, yes. I told you we get great guests on this podcast. <laughs> but is it fair to say that coalition of unity is dissolving and where do you think we're at with the revolution it's this is a revolution 40 plus years in the making this regime has been oppressing the people of iran for 40 years 40 plus years now and we've had many movements throughout these 40 years and this one i think it's quite different because I think this was the first time that the entire global Iranian community and non-Iranian community came together and came to this realization of this travesty that's been going on for so long and to raise awareness about what's happening. And it, it's been so incredible to watch celebrities from all backgrounds, public figures, etc., come together in, in amplifying the message of Iranian people. I'm not so much concerned about the particular coalition you're referring to dissolving than all of us really staying on this mission to support a free and truly democratic Iran. And not just those of us here in diaspora, but every single human who believes in democracy and the right to live independent, healthy, productive, joyful lives, the basic human rights that we're asking for, free of fear of persecution and worse that we've seen. This week is the 40th anniversary of killing of 10 Baha'i women that were killed 40 years ago by this regime. And each of their stories, one after the other, were inspiring individuals who were killed by that regime just because they believed in the Baha'i faith. As you can see, this has been going on for a long time and ignored for a long time. With the political discourse around the woman life freedom movement gaining momentum, there is a growing consensus among experts and the sentence that the current regime cannot be reformed and a new constitutional framework based on democratic principles must be, is the only way forward. And one of the other productive outcomes of the women life freedom movement is the Iranian communities around the globe coming together in unity, despite all the different beliefs and political views that we have had. And some haven't had. I personally don't belong to any particular political party. And the only political party that will ever mean anything is what the Iranian people will eventually choose through a democratic process. And that's what I will support because that's what they wish to have. Me as an Iranian living in a free world, do not get to decide what is right for the Iranian people who are living in that country. So that's something that's really important, I think, for all of us to think about as we go through this revolution that has now officially, you know, formed in this form that we're all pursuing. And really, at the end of the day, wish for a peaceful result for the Iranian people and what they want. Yeah, so many good points. They've lost all legitimacy. 
this Islamic Republic and the Ayatollah regime. That's for sure. They were losing legitimacy, but they've lost it altogether. They have a crashing economy. They have a currency that's worth less than toilet paper. They have a society that has so much hatred towards them. It's the biggest hostage crisis in the world. That's the reality. And the diaspora have been terrific from September to December. It became more difficult because I think what happened was sometimes it's difficult for the community of Iranians to agree on things because we. Ha I think a lot of the times someone knows more, or I know better than you, or ego gets in the way. Mm -hmm. And I've always said in any platform that I've been on, just concentrate on winning, okay? And getting rid of these scumbags once yes. and for all, okay? It's about winning the path to victory because you're never going to please everyone. And in fact, if you try to please everyone, you end up pleasing no one. Absolutely. You try to get the most because I think unity and mission and purpose is the route to victory. But there will always be people that will say, I don't like him. I don't like her. And unfortunately, they will just have to see what happens. And you hope to win them over when the results come through. But you have to just think of victory and, and what that route is. But it's because also important, yeah. you know, what, one thing that I failed to mention is that if we don't have the support of the political leaders and governments and those that are actually dealing with the regime, that are enabling them to continue doing what they're doing, then, you know, I, I don't mean to be a pessimist. We can be as loud as we can be and as uh, amplify the message as uh, much as that we can. But if we don't have their backing and their support, then it's going to be very difficult. And we definitely don't want any sort of military intervention. As we all know, we don't want more sanctions on the people. What's, you know, what there's, I just was speaking to two different Iranian American charities that have OFAC licenses to help and support and send money to Iran. And the stories I'm hearing about the problems that people are facing with the economy issues, with lack of medications and healthcare, the things that the basic needs of humans that are missing in that country, in this rich country. And here they're stopping people to really basically having those basic human rights that they need to have. We really can have, they can't afford having more sanctions on people because then they can't really get what they need. So there is this vicious cycle that's going on. And if we don't get the people of the governments to support us and be behind the people of Iran, then we're not going to be able to succeed. Yeah, no, so right. Because one of the key ingredients to revolution success is international support. And if you think about that cult of death that came in 1979, when Khomeini was sitting down with his yogurt and onions in Paris, and it was Time's Person of the Year, a lot of these Western powers, they have a moral obligation, in my opinion, to support the revolution because they helped to put this regime yeah. into power. Yeah. It's been now known in terms of leaks that I think Carter's administration told the military to, to not do a coup and to hold back. And there was some kind of communications going on with Khomeini and his team in the West and stuff like that. You couldn't make it up. So what you, I think it's about boxing clever and trying to win over that support and say, you know what, just imagine what a great and free Iran could be how great it would be in terms of the way it would be for the world and everything else. You wouldn't have the IRGC who's the biggest state sponsor of terrorism in town. Some people argue they don't want Iran to be good because they get cheap oil and stuff and it benefits them. But then, you know, this is self-dependent now. They've got, they don't need oil. And then you've got the other surrounding countries like the GCC because they're making nice, they're making deals now with Saudi. They're looking to Egypt and all of these kind of things because out of a place of desperation, those regimes want in Iran. That's rubbish because they know this 85 million sleeping giant and its culture and its history and its greatest resource of all is its, its people beyond mm -hmm. oil, which is the second largest reserves in the world, the fourth largest reserves in the world second largest reserves of gas and all of the rest of it. It's less competition. They want the bad in to put them in place. But what was great about this revolution thus far was that the mindset was about taking self-accountability, self-responsibility, and to basically 
take ownership of this revolution and move forwards. So we shall see where this goes. Father time reveals all, but I think they're in a place where you could probably see the next phase of this revolution where the middle class have now become poor and yes. people will be compelled to be activated because of hunger. So let's now deal with you because we've spoken a lot about this because of the fact that you're such a community person and your love for Iran and the community and your activism. But you as a career person, because you're having a hell of a career, how did it all start and what made you get into tech and marketing and branding and all the things that you're doing? I was very lucky that right off the bat, I entered an industry at the age of 22 that probably the entire world depends on, and that's and telecommunication and technology and communication, because without it, we just think about it. No industry, no sector can really function. Us individuals cannot function if we don't have access to telecommunications and technology. So I'm really blessed that I was able to start off my career in this industry and really learn so much from it and really grow with it and work for some of the most incredible Fortune 500 companies to startups and really have a diverse experience in growing and learning and traveling the world and meeting incredible people along the way. So I started, as I mentioned, in early days of long distance services, like something that we don't even think about anymore. We used to pay for long distance and phone services. And now, you know, we have voice over IP and we use all these different apps and technologies to make free phone calls. But at the time it was a pretty big deal and a lot of countries outside of US were still private uh, dominated by the government so they were in, as far as their telecom services concerned uh, were concerned therefore it was very expensive for them to make long distance calls so i started my journey in this sector of telecommunication called international callback and working out of the basement of my cousin and her husband's startup in Toronto. I moved from LA to Toronto to really help them build that business. And I moved back to LA six months later and really had a crash course, learning anything and everything about business and startups and technology. And really being young, you also absorb really fast and learn quickly. And obviously I had the desire and the passion. So I returned to Los Angeles six months later and started working for another telecom startup. And from there, my journey began. And it's been an incredible experience that I would never exchange for anything else. And in the process of the past nine years, I've been with a company called Ribbon Communications that I helped rename, rebrand, and relaunch essentially due to the result of multiple mergers that we had back in 2017. And that has been another experience added to my journey, being able to understand the dynamics of different cultures within two different companies coming from different parts of the world and bringing them all together as one global uh, unit in serving 140 plus countries and representing having offices in over 30 countries and 4,000 employees of all backgrounds and then renaming the company and rebranding and really getting everybody internally and externally to buy into this new concept and this new brand that you're introducing and then ringing the bell at NASDAQ and to making it official. So it's been incredible and I'm really, I feel really lucky to have been part of these opportunities. And obviously you have to work hard and prove yourself. It doesn't just happen. I've had to travel 70 to 80% of my time early on in this job, which took a huge toll on me physically. And I've been through, and that's how Beta's Kitchen came about to really taking a step back and focusing on myself through nutrition, through wellness and sharing that with the world. It's really a passion project. It's not a business. And maybe it will be a business one day, but for now it's a passion project and also exercising all that stuff to balance off the hard work that you put out. Everybody works hard these days. No, I don't know anybody who doesn't have a challenging job. I don't, not too many people can say that and kudos to those who have it. But I think most of us have stressful days, especially with what's all that's happening in the world and and personal lives and especially post pandemic, it's important for us to find the work-life balance element. So that's been my career slash personal journey the past almost three decades or more. Ringing that NASDAQ bell, eh? I've seen that so many times on CNBC and stuff. That must have been it's fun. Friend. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Would you 
proud moment when you're there, you're standing, you come out and look at that giant screen outside. You see your entire team, your leadership, yourself up there. And it's a very rewarding moment to feel you're seen and your hard work is paying off. Yeah. Totally. Because people need to have career recognition. It's one Absolutely. of the re main reasons why people leave along with toxic bosses and toxic working cultures. We're in the era of the personal brand. And people are either going to be an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. We're creating an economic system where you can't rely on your salary to get wealthy. You need multiple streams of income. You really do. So you mentioned it briefly about Beta's Kitchen. And there are people now making giant YouTube channels out of food. I've seen it. I've seen some people that travel all around the world. They call themselves a professional food eater mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You do it from the cooking perspective, but have you always loved cooking? Did that just come naturally where you just wanted to showcase the best in class of Iranian cuisine and food, etc.? I think I've always liked cooking. I remember starting cooking in the early, mid to late 90s. And I started cooking from one of the oldest <clears throat> Persian cookbooks that have existed by a woman uh, named Miss Rosa Montazemi. And I had a copy of it. And I started one day, I wanted to start making Persian food. And my mom always worked. As I mentioned early on, she was, she started her life over here at 45. So she was still working. So she was never really there. Like, mom's back home or I didn't have my grandmother here so that I can stand next to them in the kitchen to learn. So I had to start on my own. And I guess I did have the passion and I became right away somebody who cooked all the time come years later. Fast forward to 2017, I had a very rewarding and a very stressful year. I accomplished things in one month. I remember November of 2017 that probably some people don't accomplish in a lifetime. Again, I feel truly blessed from bringing in, uh, branding and relaunching a company to producing one of the most incredible artistic events in Los Angeles to competing in a and dance competition for charity, like a dancing with the star style competition. So I went through a lot and then suddenly I started feeling it physically. And, and I realized at that time, finally, I went to see a doctor and see what's going on with me. I had gained weight. I was fatigued. I was tired. And I found out that I'm going through early stages of menopause, these hormones and the stress levels all colliding. And that's when I had my aha moment. And I realized, Vita, you need to stop. You need to slow down. Uh, obviously, I still had to travel and I still had to do what I had to do for my job. But when I did come home, I needed to really reset the button and really start doing self-care. And that's when I started making healthy, quick, rustic meals. And it was the early days of sharing food on social media. So I started sh sharing my very simple videos of cooking basic Persian food that were healthier or more health conscious, I should say, on social media. And that's when it started picking up momentum and people started relating to somebody like me who has a busy day job and is coming home and instead of ordering in, which is very easy to order food and just do a quick pickup from your local favorite restaurant, I started cooking at home and showing how under 30 minutes you can make a beautiful dish that's healthy and delicious. So that's how Vita's Kitchen Concept got started. And then in 2018, based on the momentum it had gained, I made it official and called it Vita's Kitchen and started its social media channels and coming from a marketing and branding background, I created the logo for it and tried to make it as marketing savvy and presentable as possible. And during the pandemic, it got even more, had got, it, it, the engagement went higher and really the focus on how can we all make healthy, delicious food at home while taking care of ourselves and our family and all that good stuff. So that's how the, that journey began. And I haven't really had much time since returning to the more regular work schedule to create content for it. And, uh, hopefully I will one day again, and yeah, maybe I will be a YouTube phenomenon. <laughs> we'll see. You certainly got that factor and why not? Why not? I, from what I see of Instagram, and I'm a foodie, I watch all the foodie programs for MasterChef and all that kind of stuff. I love it. I think there's potential there. Uh, and why not you elevate that? You see that, you see some programs around food cooking of the region 
So there's one guy who does his YouTube channel from Azerbaijan and he's in the kind of mountains and he's cooking kebab and this and that. And he always does a catchphrase, suba, at the end of it. And then you've, I've seen some around Iranian community, an Iranian family that are doing some Iranian cooking in a certain, in the mountains or villages, but why not have the Shazam and the kind of glitz that you can give it as well as a modern edge for a bigger audience? The other thing that I've used my platform for that I want to address is that I think food is the, that's my slogan, that food unites. And once we taste each other's cuisine from different backgrounds, we really connect and really can really have a dialogue and conversations about social issues and everything else in between. And I've also cooked for charity as part of these immigrant dinner series, collaborating with non-Iranian restaurants and going into the kitchen and collaborating with the chef and adding a Persian menu to the uh, that special of the week or day, whatever it is that we did. And really, again, another method of bringing unity and understanding through culture, which food is a huge part of it. So those are the different things. So yeah, I do have an idea for a cooking show that brings all of these together that I just need to develop. Just finding that time in the day to do all these things. But I think being an entrepreneur, you have to first be a creative and passionate person because you don't know, I don't know any entrepreneur who's not a creative person, because if you don't have the creativity and the, the ideas that develop in your head that become reality and it become a business form and it all starts from there. Yeah. I, and I believe in reinventing ourselves all the time. And I believe in trying everything and anything that we enjoy doing in this lifetime. And I've been, I've heard this and I've been told this, you're doing too many different things. You need to focus. And these are people who didn't know all my different facets that I actually do have a full-time day job. And all these other things are my passion projects that some of them don't make me money, but fulfill me in so many other ways. And it's my way of giving back. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing two, three different things all at the same time, as long as you're accomplishing and as long as you're not risking things that are impacting your personal well-being or those around you that you care for. Yeah, absolutely. You're a real go-getter and I'm sure it must be great to be your friend because they're not going to go hungry. <laughs> Whenever there's a party around we your house. We boxes at every gathering in our home. So everybody goes home. They eat at our home. And I, I, I just don't know how to make small portions. I always make large portions, family style. And I actually used to get criticized on social media during the pandemic. You make so much food and on camera, everything looks much larger. So I would have to explain myself. First of all, it's not that much. Second of all, I make it for my family or during the pandemic when we were ill and they couldn't make food for themselves. But yeah, but even when we have parties at our house, I would always make sure that I have extra and everybody takes home. So Johnny, come time to come and visit. Yeah, I've got a good friend in Orange County. So that's a good excuse uh, if yes. I didn't need one. Yes. Uh, so it's really important what you're doing because Iran has suffered many conquests from Alexander and the Macedonians and the Battle of Issus. And then you had the Mongols who tried to wipe out 90% of the Persian community the Iranian community. And then you've had the Arab conquest, but Iranians have still maintained their identity, their language, and their food. And food is a critical element. And it's one of the greatest cuisines there is out there. I think one of the best kept secrets really from all the usual suspects that we know in the West. When it comes to entrepreneurialism, does it come naturally to you like branding does, marketing does? And by the way, folks, she's also an amazing dancer, <laughs> loves the salsa and tango. You should check that out. But did it come naturally to you being an entrepreneur? Mm, as I mentioned, I think you have to be a creative person to be an entrepreneur. And I want to say that I have an entrepreneurial mindset, but I haven't really explored it and really done it justice. And I think I'm at a stage in my life and career that I really want to dive into those areas that I and take more risks and being an entrepreneur, you also have to be a risk taker. And, and I think a lot of us who come from the more, the challenging background of being an immigrant and always worrying about the future, etc. Some have actually dove into entrepreneurship and taken those risks and some have played it safe. And I feel like I've been in between, even though I've always, I have started my own companies and invested in 
really high risk artistic productions and thankfully come out of it fulfilled because of the outcome of the project. And most of the time with those artistic projects as a producer, you don't really make money, but I think there is a potential there. So I really want to pursue that side in the, in my next phase of career coming soon, but also you can apply entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial mindset, even working in a large corporation, because that's where it's most needed in a way, because we can't just play it safe in, an, in, in a corporate environment. We always have to have that bringing those ideas that usually comes from an entrepreneurial mindset into an organization so that the company can grow. I think it's something that I have learned along the way because of having worked with incredible leaders around me. Some of them have become my best of friends and allies and mentors to this day. If I get stuck, I can call my a CEO of 20 years ago, who's a dear friend and get advice from him or somebody who I work with 22 years ago, who I, who's still in my Rolodex that I follow. And she's been an incredible supporter of mine. So I think it's a combination of things, being a successful entrepreneur or being entrepreneurial. Yeah. Being a successful Iranian like you are and that word success can be somewhat relative where people say, oh, it was success, everything else. What does success mean now to you at this point of your life? I think success to me is being the ability to be simply happy, Johnny. If you're not happy, I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how many homes and cars and designer bags and shoes you have. You can never truly enjoy them if you're not happy and content with yourself. We're all confronted with tragedy, with hardship and sadness every day. We see it either, whether it's in our own personal lives or in the communities or in the society, we see these uh, horrific stories that can impact us for us not to feel our best or be too, truly happy. I personally just lost my brother last month after battling a brain tumor for just less than a year. And that takes a toll on you. So no matter how successful I am, if sadness comes into the picture and tragedy enters, success means nothing. So it's important to have love and so that, you know, in your life, whether it's with your partner, whether it's with your family, with your friends that help you get through those dark days and those sad days so that you can continue enjoying your success. I have learned that sensitive people, I, must, I consider myself a sensitive person, have a diff more difficult time getting through those challenging days. And I just, you just have to have your eyes and hearts open uh, when things like this happen and just emerge from that, those grieving days. Mm, happiness to me is a butterfly that shows up at your door after somebody really near and dear passes away and gives you a signal that they're there still. I believe in, I want to believe in those things that gives me motivation. Happiness to me is that believing that you can prevail and that at the end of the day, you can turn to happiness, which is in return is success. We all face disappointments. And again, we all lose family members and friends. We're all confronted with health challenges, with a pandemic, <laughs> with fear of terrorism, concern about community. So all of those things is part of life and part of this journey. We can't let them bring us down. We just have to ride with them, go through the highs and lows. I definitely have been through many lows in my journey, but I try to offset them with my highs. I'm fortunate that I'm married to somebody who's my best friend and my partner in everything. And I'm gratefully in a constant high because I have that person next to me and helping me get through those really low days. So that success is a combination of all these things, being able to get through the emotionals, emotional part of the day while you do the hard work alongside with it, with your work or your business or whatever it is. First and foremost, sorry for your loss. It's difficult to put into words when these things happen in life and it does hit you and in the end your health is your wealth and i often say there are two types of people in life the first type are they're like passing ships at night they come and they go and the second type of person are the ones that leave their footprints all over your heart and they become an integral part like your partner your life partner everyone needs someone to mm -hmm. share that journey of life with. 
and the butterfly example is a beautiful one. <laughs> when it comes to lessons in life, what's the hardest lesson in your life that you've had to endure in your life? It's a simple one to forgive and to forget. When you're somebody who's somebody like me and many others who are very out there and doing so much, it's a given that with that comes a lot of good things and also not so good things. A lot of broken hearts, but through friendships and partnerships and things that you do that come along with it. And it's all learning experiences. There is no regrets for sure, but to be able to forgive and forget so that you can move on to the next chapter and to the next thing that you can do to be impactful and making a difference is definitely the hardest one. Yeah, I love that because it's not always easy. It's not. Because people hold on to things. I always think the best way to in life, if you've been hurt, is to get on and have a great life to move forwards rather than be consumed with bitterness, anger, revenge, all the human emotions that rightly or wrongly people can go through. Have you ever been asked to change something about yourself? I think we're ever evolving beings. By no means do I feel like I'm perfect. I make mistakes all the time, even though when you become somewhat of a public person and people start following your work or want to follow your footsteps or the way your life leads, they expect you to be perfect. They expect you to never make mistakes, but I want to be believed that I am an ever a growing person and nobody has ever asked me about changing anything about myself yet but i do believe that i am uh, again an ever evolving person that needs to continue to learn and grow and try to be even a better person tomorrow than the next day and the next day and next day yeah because i think one of your superpowers is that you've just got this good feel factor to you so when you watch something about you or something else i think you make things feel good and that is, that's an important quality. And it's not something that everyone can communicate and articulate. You've got this kind of vibe of energy to you that no matter what, you just communicate love, positiveness, good energy, that kind of feel. I that's mean, my interesting view. Anyway. I think having a positive attitude and being a positive person, it's something that we all should try to be by no means am I, I'm, I have my very sad, dark days myself. I go through those days, especially again, with all that's been going on in the global community with all the sadness impacts you and also your own personal challenges that happen. But at the end of the day, if we don't stay positive and we're not talking about this fake positive, fake, I mean, I, you need to also talk about those not so happy days and not so great things that happen. But at the end of the day, if we don't remain positive and have a positive outlook, then we can get through those difficult days and sad days. But yeah, and the only way you can really be that positive and push forward is to be content with who you are as an individual while working on yourself and giving back and spreading love. Because if we spread love and have a loving behavior and ho hopefully that reciprocates and we can all continue having this cycle of life in that context versus hate and revenge and all that not so good feel vibes. Yeah, so true because hurt people and it's just breaking that cycle. So as we come towards the end of this podcast, my last two remaining questions. And then I want to talk about what's next for Beta and what you're up to. What has surprised you in your career and your life to date? Good question. How resourceful I am, how resilient I can be. I've not always been this confident for sure. It's been all these life lessons and all these hurdles that I've been through. A lot of people think, tell me, a lot of my club, like, you're, but you're so strong. You're so strong. You can get through it. And then when I share with them some of my challenges or what have you, 
And, but what I can say is that I can bounce back after the most even difficult circumstance pretty quickly. And I have to always though, remind myself that I need to reset the button and learn from what just happened to me or what experience I went through. And again, that resilient part that I think most immigrants and refugees who go through the hardships that they do possess that quality of resilience. Yeah, I, I believe you have that bouncy bum factor, the ability to get back up when you're knocked out, because it's yeah. easy when you're winning. Yeah. It's how you deal with adversity that I think separates those that go on to be truly successful and happy. And lastly, what are you most proud about in your life? I would love to believe that I am making a positive impact, even though if it's just a tiny bit strive for that and i hope to continue delivering on what i preach is being the change in the world being the change that we want to see in the world and being a part of that and helping others who have the capability and the potential or the resources to be in the change to make a difference in the world a positive difference being their enabler and supporting them so that's something that i would like to be known for or be proud of and you're also a very loving grandma, wife, yes. family person. And I've seen Those that time and time again. are my joy. And I'm so blessed that the, even though I didn't have children on my own, I have a wonderful stepson and his wonderful wife that have given us the five beautiful, loving grandchildren and who consider me their nini. And I get to spend time with them and share what I can with them, especially through my cooking. They love the tadik, the potato tadik, especially. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So what's next for you and how can people get in touch with you if they want to find out more about Beta's kitchen, what Beta is up to, what's the best socials, all of that kind of stuff. I want to surprise myself every day. I don't know what's next for me yet. I'm enjoying this stage of my life. I have a big milestone birthday coming up in September. I'm hoping to enjoy this summer and really, again, do a little bit more self-care. I've been working nonstop since I was 16 years old, not counting the two years living in Germany, distributing magazines on my little bicycle to make pocket money. So it's been a nonstop three plus decades of me working and, and I'm loving it, but I want to see what I can think of and cook up this summer as my next big passion project. So follow me at Beta Melanian I'm on most social media channels. I'm pretty responsive when friends reach out and always open to collaboration, always open to new suggestions and ideas, and always open to helping projects that, again, make a difference in the world, a positive difference, and playing a small role in it. And last but not least, my passion project, the, uh, the latest one that I launched in January is Iranians in Film and TV. Film and TV is a huge and important platform to relay the message of any culture or community. And I think Iranians in film and TV have been very impactful over the past four decades. And I want to see how we can do more on that front and telling the Iranian story in a more legitimate, correct way while supporting all the talent that is working in that industry globally and hopefully producing a film or two or more. <laughs> I think you're fantastic. You're a true Iranian lioness. You're authentic. You're consistent. You lead with your heart. And I would love to see Beta's Kitchen on national Iranian TV in a free Iran beyond the I Islamic would love Republic. That. I would love that. That would be so amazing. And traveling throughout Iran and learning from the different cultures and regions would be a dream come true. We're going to adjust. So thank you so much. It's been an absolute, ple absolute pleasure. And this has been Successful Iranians.